beginning. All right. Well, um, we have Icelandic sheep here in Paola, Kansas, and we raise them for their wool. So they get haircuts twice a year. It's called shearing. And they live out on pasture. They eat grass and they eat hay in the wintertime. And right now, the grass isn't growing quite as quickly as it did before. So we're transitioning from grass to hay. So we're gonna put out some bales of hay later today and they'll come in and they'll eat the hay. But right now, most of them are out there on pasture, you can see. And out there with the sheep are three guard llamas. So what do you think the guard llamas have to do? What are they guarding the sheep against? In Minnesota, wolves was the right answer. Here, coyotes or coyotes and the neighbor's dog. And my dog, if she got out, because I have a border collie, and she is not here to work with the sheep, okay? These sheep respond to arm movements because I used to milk them in Minnesota, and I made cheese. I was a cheese maker. And so they're very comfortable around people for the most part. And I try to keep everything really nice and calm. That being said, we have free-range birds. We have uh, Rhode Island red hens. We have Tacky Campbell ducks. They both give us eggs and we have guinea hens. The guinea hens have been following the sheep around because we've had visitors yesterday and today, and we normally don't feed our sheep uh, grain, but they have some sweet feed, and the guinea hens have been standing under the sheep eating whatever the sheep drop. So when they see a group come up, they start screaming, and they may start screaming, and we might not be able to hear one another, but let's go up there and see if we can't find a sheep to pet and to feed, and maybe a guard llama. Earlier today, the three guard llamas were hanging out in the barn. They weren't guarding the sheep, so I told them to get to work because that's what they're supposed to do. And the guinea hens, the ones that are so noisy, they're here to eat ticks. Their job is to eat ticks and to make sure that we don't have a lot of flies on the farm. Because as a former cheesemaker, I really do not like flies. And they will eat larvae, eggs, these bugs, they love these. So that's their job, that's why we keep them. And I want you to ask any questions that you have. Um, and I'll, I'll keep talking about the sheep. Oh, I can see the ducks out there too. Um, free range sometimes means that they're in a cage that people move around. Our birds are really free range. You'll see them over 40 acres. And the guinea hens go out to the apiary where the bees are kept. Uh, they go wherever they want to. Um, and then at night, they know that they're safe if they go back in the chicken coop. So the chickens, ducks, and guineas all go into the, the coop every evening. Questions? Okay. We had a little bit of rain here. I heard the city had a lot more rain. We got about two inches on this farm. We had a major flood. If There's a 10-acre pasture down there that was wiped out and all of these raised beds took out the electric fencing. So we've had to replant that in brome grass. And these raised beds, I'm gonna plant the garlic here this coming week and I'm gonna move the asparagus, the rhubarb and the strawberries. But all of the, the fall crops, everything that I was going to have for Thanksgiving, you don't wanna eat it because flood water could have bacteria in it and you just don't know. And somebody said, well, can't you can't you take those beautiful sweet potatoes? We went down there and looked, and the sweet potatoes looked really nice. Can't you feed those to the sheep? And so do you think that would be a good idea if we thought that there was bacteria in them? We didn't want to eat them. I wouldn't want to feed them to the sheep. Okay, it's a little muddy. Let's go up to the barn. We'll go through the barn. And this, this is an electric fence here. And it's really, it serves two purposes. One, to keep the sheep in but more importantly to keep the, the predators out. And you'll see there's a second fence in there that's also got electricity in it because we've got some really smart sheep that said, you know what, when my wool is really thick before I get sheared or shorn, that's not gonna hurt me when I go through there. And so they can go through that fence and they do. I've got some that are just really naughty sheep. So um, I think, well, we can look at how many jewels, but I'll tell you, I touched the fence down there and I went, I screamed and I said, did you hear that? Because <laughs> I could hear this boom in my head, <laughs> in my ears. Um, it's got a bite to it. You don't, you don't, want, yeah. you don't want to touch that. 
Um, coyotes and dogs, they lead with their nose. And so the first thing they're gonna do, if they touch that wire with their nose, is get a shock. The sheep put their heads between the wires and then the wool keeps them from getting zapped. So these ones that have been so naughty all summer, I'm really looking forward to November 12th when they've lost their wool. Next time they try to get out, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, sheep abuse. <laughs> all right, this is all muddy from the, um, the rainwater. And we were just spreading that rock this morning. We're trying to figure this farm out. We've been here for a year and a half. And you couldn't see that, that pond. We're trying to restore the pastures and the land. There's buckthorn and locusts and there was Johnson grass. It was really a mess. And oh, there were broken toilet seats. I should don't put that on, on the news because somebody lived here. But it was really, it was neglected. So we're learning the land and trying to trying to make some improvements. We have plenty of sheep in here. We're going to go very, very, now don't move too fast toward the sheep because they'll, they're flight animals. Let's see. Let's give them a reason not to run away. This is what they normally don't get. It's called sweet feed. So if everybody wants to take a little handful of that. And what we're going to do with the sheep the sheep, they only have teeth on the bottom. And they have a hard palate on top. So they couldn't even bite somebody if they wanted to. Not very effectively. So if something startles them, like a loud noise, or if somebody moves really fast, they run away. Right? And people say, well, that sheep doesn't like me. It's not that they don't like you. They'll come back. But the best thing is to walk up there very, very quietly. And you guys are the right height for... For taller people, if they stoop over a little bit, the sheep will come up and they'll eat right out of your hand. And it tickles. Okay, so let's try that. Who else wants to get tickled? Yeah. Oh. And normally, yesterday when we started doing this, come on, you want to feed the sheep, I know. Here you go. When, um, when they heard this, the only time they get this is if I need to get them all into the barn. Like I've got one girl that got stung by bees and I wanted to get her some penicillin in her because she's got an infection around her muzzle now. Um, so I'd get them into the barn by doing this. Well, yesterday I had people out on pasture and they heard this and 99 sheep came off pasture at once and they were like, whoa. Now the sheep are like, I'm full. I mean, they're <laughs> all right. So we have... There's my oldest sheep, who's 14 years old, which it, she's exceeded the life expectancy for this breed. She's very, very skinny, and she's got very little fleece on her. And it's really a function of age. There's nothing wrong with her. But um, every day that Hollywood is still with us is a good day. So she's the skinny girl here in front. Demori is this other little brown one. Come on, Ariat. Come on, good girls. Come on, Yogi. So because they were a dairy flock, they've got names. There you go. And this, go ahead. This is Demori here, and she would love. To, oh, no, no, uh, Aria, let Demori eat too. There you go. Okay, there you go. Good girl. All right. So, and you can, you can put your hand right between the bars too if you want to. And we have a hose. Yes. We can rinse off hands, so don't worry about a little sheep kiss. That's Ariat. And they all have, like, Ariat is a type of riding boot. Her mother's name was Boots. And we had Justin. And we had Tony. I mean, we had, so it was a way, well, you couldn't say llama when you've got guard llamas. So, um, and so then we had the chocolate girls, Valrona and Demori. And, hmm? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This is Ariat. Oh, goodness. Yes. And with, with, any animal, like the, they're fine, but with any animal, I always recommend you don't come over the top of their head first. These girls are, I just, I say start with the chest and then work your way up. I, I try to do everything in a natural way, so I check their eyelids rather than giving them dewormers. Uh -huh. And if they need it, they get it, but otherwise they don't automatically get it. So they're used to having their faces handled too. 
because then it's easier for them when I do need to, well to check them. It's over there that you're... And they give us an egg a day. All right. If anybody... Well, um, I do not know. I do not know. I'm not going to eat them, if that's what you're asking. And I don't eat lamb anymore. Um, and, and the reason that this is a fiber flock rather than a cheese operation, um, and, and I'm not judging anybody. Lamb was my go-to meat. It was my favorite red meat. But after, after raising 1,500 lambs that were born on my farm and milking their moms and taking orders for fresh lamb from the chefs in Minneapolis, we didn't just send them to market on one day. Every two weeks you get an order for six lambs. And it got worse every year. And I just, I could not, I, it's not in my temperament. I can't kill another animal. And the poor, some poor guy came up to the farmer's market and he said, you have ground lamb today? And I said, yes, how much would you like? He said, well, I tried to buy it from you last week, but you started to cry. And I honestly don't remember that, but I do know that it was, I mean, I, I can cry now about it. They trust you, and they'll walk onto this little two-horse trailer, and you, you get their pelts back an hour or two later. And, and none of us would eat meat if somebody couldn't do that for us. <laughs> so I'm really not judging, but I do know it's something I thought I could do, and I can't, because I love my sheep. <laughs> so, and this is Shepherd Scott here. This is... This is the other half of the sheep operation. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions about, oh, here's somebody late to the party. This girl that's coming in now, um, that's called Mort Mouflon Badger Face. This is a Mort spot. They all, they're all purebred registered Icelandics, but a combination of 17 colors and patterns. So that's made it even harder because you knew when you got the pelt back, you remember that animal being alive a couple of hours before. Yeah. And, um, and they were more pets. This is not really a big production operation yet. There is a leader sheep. There's a leader sheep gene in Icelandic sheep. It's actually a type of sheep. And you'll see it if you, if you Google leader sheep. You'll see, even in the barns in Iceland, when they, they have a, a roundup called Rattir in September, and they, they bring them back in from the countryside, and the boys all go to market then, one day, and the, uh, the moms go in with the breeding rams. Well, you'll see the leader sheep on her back legs, and normally they're black and white or a black spotted pattern, and they do, they're all, there's all sorts of stories about leader sheep alerting shepherds to incoming storms and bringing sheep back from the hillsides and the mountains to the barns. So it's a real thing with this particular breed. Um, we don't really have leader sheep genetics here. Um, we, ha we had a couple of sheep that you would say were, were the ones that led them in for milking, but that would be Taylor. And Taylor wasn't leader sheep. She just loved getting her little, her little alfalfa treat in the, in the dairy barn. So. Um, so today I would say there is no leader, um, and there's definitely a communication between them. Like, if one of them is getting fed and, and there's a treat like this, they'll ba, and then you'll hear several of them, and they might all run into the barn. Because they, they're probably, they probably got stomach aches from this stuff, mm -hmm. from eating it. But um, you'll see that happen, and then you have 99 sheep coming over the hill and three, three mm -hmm. guard llamas, and it's, it's not... It's, it scares people. <laughs> so there you go, Demori. Well, I, I keep really good records on the sheep, and so um, I bred for um, personality first, and by that I meant if there was any sign of aggression, I had no problem putting them on the truck. And I actually put a ewe on the truck for aggression because she almost killed other ewe's babies. There's a social order, and so when I would, I would put the breeding groups together, I wanted to make sure that um, they, had the, they had a good personality, that they were milky, they had good conformation. I didn't really breed for, um, for the fiber or the color of the fiber. 
Um, but you know, you don't want crooked legs. You want the animals to be healthy to be able to survive on pasture or thrive on pasture. Hmm? It absolutely is, and crooked legs in this breed can be straightened out in one breeding. It's really amazing to me because we did have, we, well, it, you look for a ram with incredibly straight legs, okay? The one, the, the, our, big, our starter flock, even Sage, the ones that came out of Iceland, like her mother came from Iceland. You can't import sheep, live sheep into the U.S. today, but there are genetics, genetics draws AI, a lot of artificial insemination. We didn't use natural and we, we bred our rams and we kept our breeding rams. They were age seven when they went to market because they were lovely gentlemen, I, you know. And so I'd set up, we, we probably had six or seven breeding groups and we'd make sure that you were not breeding even grandfather to granddaughter. We tried to keep as much genetic diversity in the flock as possible. Um, and it has worked out for us. But we also, when we milked the sheep, we had a third party come in and they checked production once a month at the U level. So we knew how much each sheep was giving, which gave us good information. That was nice, but I wanted somatic cell count because that's another thing I would see at the U level each month. And if your somatic cell count would you'd see it go up, then you knew you had subclinical, usually mastitis in a milking animal. And I could give them heavy doses of vitamin C and it would not progress to mastitis. And I didn't then have to give them antibiotics. If they got mastitis, it was usually when they were, they were milking their, or they were nursing their young because the babies stayed on the moms for a minimum of 30 days, maximum of 60. My goal was no more than 45 days because the milk is so rich, the babies would lift mom up off the back. They're usually twin. And some of the, some of the moms that came into the milking parlor had scabs. I mean, they were, the, the rams or the, the babies were, were rough with them. Um, I told a story yesterday, and it's, it's a true story. Hi, Yogi that um, they weaned it on one day. So I, the babies are born, they could be born on pasture, you bring them into a barn setting like this, you put them in a little jug, you make sure that mom is able to nurse them, that they're thriving, you watch them for three days, there's bonding, then you put them into a pen area where there might be six moms and 12 babies. And then they learn that even though mom is a brown sheep, I can't go and start nursing off of another brown sheep, she's gonna, she's gonna push me away. And then they're turned out onto pasture with mom. So the, it's a progression. And um, what was I saying? I kind of lost my train of thought in terms of the babies. Oh, so then when weaning day comes, uh, the moms are brought into the parlor twice a day. And then they're on pasture as far away from that lambing barn as you can get them. And the babies cry for 48 hours. And it's heartbreaking because they're calling for mom, right? And some of the moms are like, <laughs> I've had enough of that and others would come in and they would find their way out of that pasture they'd go through their electric fence and it could be you know it's 160 acres they could be in the far corner of that pasture and you'd find them on the opposite side of their babies the babies are on one side and mom's on the other so what do you do okay how much do you like sheep's milk cheese nobody likes it that much so I mean <laughs> Then I'd take that mom and I'd let her raise that baby. And, and then her only struggle was she had to make sure that the other babies weren't trying to nurse off of her. So you had to watch that because you don't want her being harassed. But there were probably four moms each year that did not get milked because that bond was just too strong. Did you start over and milk her? Yeah. Did that break the rules? What did that one do that you put in the kids? That one, we think, got into a nest of ground hornets and she was absolutely deformed with with welts and she's she's a very skittish sheep she doesn't I mean, if I go over there she'll stamp her foot which is one thing that they can say you know back off they can't do anything more than that but um, and she she has an infection around her muzzle so Scott came down at midnight on on uh, Friday evening first thing we did Saturday morning was to get her up here. And it was easy because we had grain and they hadn't seen grain in a while, so the whole flock came in. And we jugged her up and I gave her 10 cc's, which is a slug of penicillin, with B-complex. 
She had it yesterday morning and she had it last night. And she's got her own little store of hay. She's got her own little bucket of water. She was on her hind legs 